info. <coughs> all right, I guess we'll get going. It's six, and you're all here. With this way, if those of you who didn't hear the joke earlier, Manchester Ranger District had uh, had a meeting about this, and they only had two folks show up to their meeting. So um, we're happy to see so many people here and interested in um, recreation on the National Forest, whether it be on Manchester or up here on Rochester or over on Middlebury or wherever. Um, so I'd like to keep this um, as formally formally informal as po possible. So um, we have a short little presentation that we'll go through just to kind of set the stage. And then um, we'll just go where the conversation takes us at that point, listen to any questions or comments or concerns you might have on the recreation site analysis. Um, so if you don't know me, my name is Chris Matrick and I'm the district <coughs> ranger here on the Rochester and Middlebury Ranger District. I've been here since 2012. And then, um, Holly, you want to introduce yourself? I think mean, everybody knows you, but do it anyway. Sure. I'm Holly Knox. I'm the Forest Recreation Program Manager. As of recent, a couple of months ago, I was the Rochester and Middlebury Recreation Program Manager. So um, we don't have any name tag. I mean, we could give you name tags, but we, we left name tags in the closet tonight. So. Um, I think many of you know each other, but everybody probably doesn't know everybody. I'm not going to go around the room and have everybody introduce himself, but maybe when we get to the, we start to make comments or have questions or something, if you, before you ask your question or make your comment, maybe you could just introduce yourself um, and let, let us know where you're from so that everybody in the room knows who you are. Um, I don't think there's any more introductory things. Anything else come to your mind? I'm going to say things, and then Holly will correct me if I go wrong. <laughs> and, that, and then if Holly's talking, I'll interject something, and then uh, that probably Fair won't enough. be right. Um, so, but can you think of anything else? No. Okay. So you're here in case you, you know, you might be in the wrong meeting. Um, just in case you want to be sure, we're here to talk about um, the recreation facility strategy and the recreation site analysis in particular. It's a five-year strategic plan. Um, it is um, one thing that it is, it is not, and I'll probably say this a couple times, this isn't a decision document, um, this is a strategy. So we can't go out tomorrow and take action on any of the things that you know, might be in that site, that, that document right there, the recreation um, site analysis document, facility analysis, um, until we do NEPA on it, the National Emp Environmental Policy Act review, unless it's some like administrative change. Um, but that would be handled, that wouldn't even be in there, we would handle that in, in the background. Um, so some things that are contained for the north half, for the Rochester and Middlebury, already have National Environmental Policy Act clearance on it, like all the work coming out of the Robinson Project, recreation work coming out of the Robinson Project that was here in, in, in Rochester and Hancock and, and Stockbridge and Pittsfield, um, that work's already been approved. You'll see some of that work in the document, you'll see some of that work up there on the map um, as well. This is a strategy, um, is a one, one step to develop a, a, like a five-year plan for managing sustainable recreation resources um, here on the district and the forest. I'm, I'm going to try not to read the slide because you're all capable of, of reading that slide. Um, you know, some of the things that we, we want to do is we want to use the dollars, your tax dollars, um, as wisely as possible in maintaining the, the facilities and the infrastructure and recreation that matters the most to you and to the general public um, and look at kind of either downsizing or in some cases removing underutilized sites, sites that don't get a lot of use. Um, that's not to say that we wouldn't add a facility or a trail or infrastructure at some location if we felt that there was a public demand for that. Um, but we're looking to be sustainable in the long run, and that's typically going to mean we're not going to build, 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 build a lot of new infrastructure. But that doesn't mean that we're not going to capitalize on an opportunity um, to make a connection um, or to build some infrastructure that we feel is needed in the area so that the public would benefit from. It's a balancing act. So as I said earlier, this is not a decision document um, so this is just going to guide our thinking moving forward for the next five years um, and then the, the actions would require NEPA if we were going to do any ground disturbing activity. Various levels of NEPA. It could be a, a, a quick letter to the file, it could be a full-blown environmental assessment. Um, it's going to depend on the work that we're doing.
So these documents are, are, are living and breathing. They're not static. So when you leave here tonight, it's out of date already. Um, once we sign the document, it, you know, the next day, something could come up that could change our thinking about something moving forward. So we, we can't be stuck in the rut of like, oh, well, we didn't put it in the rec site analysis, so no, 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 we're going to avoid this, this wonderful opportunity that's before us. Or that we're going to say, well, no, we can't close that because it, we said in the rec site analysis that we would maintain it. This is a snapshot at this point in time to help us guide our thinking, not the ultimate decision that will be made. You know, this will, this will change over time through um, thinking about integrated resource projects. You know, we just finished Robinson here in, in the towns around the office here, and now we're looking at Telephone Gap, which is primarily in, in Chittenden, Killington, Menden. Um, that will have some recreation um, proposals that come out of it. Hopefully those are being captured in the RSA as it exists, but that's not to say that they absolute, everyone absolutely will be. Something could come up in 2021 as we're moving towards the NEPA analysis part of that project that might ad be added to the rec site analysis. We're hoping to look at this document is going to guide us in looking at the big picture, not just that we, I mean, I focus on the district. Holly now looks at the forest level, so hopefully it's going to see 30,000 feet and not two feet from the ground. We can, we'll use this to guide us in thinking about downsizing and decommissioning, and then also in um, determ determining sustainable activities, investments, new infrastructure that we might need, and the locations where we provide that infrastructure. If you have questions, you don't have to hold them until I get done. If you want to like, interject me, I can go on ad nauseum. Um, you know, why, I said, um, why, why do we want this? Um, we can't afford um, to support a huge backlog of infrastructure maintenance. Um, it's becoming clearer and clearer over time. Our appropriations are not what they once were. Um, you know, the pendulum does swing from, you know, being flush to being ooh, a little tight on funding. Um, but within the swing of that pendulum, we have to operate and we can't be way outside even the high swing, which, you know, I think at some point in the past, um, all of the national forests in the eastern region were, you know, riding high, build, 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 build new infrastructure without any thoughts about the long-term cost of trying to maintain that infrastructure. Um, and we have to be very cognizant of that today, given where our um, appropriations are at and where we envision them going. And then we want to ensure that, you know, as you, recreation partners and individuals interested in recreation, come forward to us and ask us questions about infrastructure that we have and infrastructure that you might be thinking that, hey, that, wouldn't it be awesome to have a trail that connected X to Y? Or wouldn't it be great to have a, you know, a new, a new picnic ground at some location, you know, we have to have a process for that, which we do have, but we also have to ensure that that's affordable and sustainable in the long run, which might mean that, you know, we, we try to be accommodating, we try to, we, we like to have people approach us with ideas, things that maybe we're not thinking of, um, but there are times that we're, we're going to have to say, mm, no, we're going to have to pass on that at this point in time. The strategy should help us guide, will help ensure that that's um, evenly balanced, that we're not willy-nilly about it, that our approach is um, uniform. So here's our, um, the steps in this process. So you're engaging tonight um, with us, and as I said, we've already had one on the Manchester Ranger District, and that's it, right, Holly? There's not going to be another one? Very good. Um, there's also, you can also um, review it online as well. And you can make comments online or you can make comments here tonight and we'll review all those comments um, that you, excuse me, that you make. Come on in. There's some chairs over here. There's a pile of chairs right behind me that we can free up for y'all to sit in. Based on those comments, we might update some of the information in the RSA. We would, might update some management actions, proposed management actions. Again, remember that those proposed management actions still have to go through an environmental analysis. Just updating them in this document doesn't make it so we can go out and do it. And then we'll finalize um, 
the plan, the strategy, and then we'll look for opportunities to implement it as funding, capacity, and by capacity I mean our staff capacity to do it, and opportunity arises. Um, we'll get to the end of five years and we'll look back on this and I guarantee you there'll be things in there that we have not implemented even though that we said we were going to. Um, so don't think, we would like to think that we would accomplish everything in there. We know from history that we will not. Um, it's just the, it's the way it goes. Um, things come up, priorities change, um, appropriations change. So we do our best to follow along with that strategy. This is very similar to those of you who um, commented or were aware of the comprehensive trail strategy that we did a few years back. We also did a travel analysis process a few years back. This is a very similar document to those documents, only this one's focused on, focused on recreation sites, um, where it's a guiding document. <coughs> Um, so that comprehensive trail strategy, we've moved forward some things, we've accomplished some of those things, and some of those things have changed. We've changed our mind about a couple of them, um, and we know that when we get to the end of five years, not all of them are going to be complete. So we want to hear from you. So this is an open house. It's also a, an engagement session. You can comment online at that address. Um, the comment period runs from, just like we do in our environmental analysis process, we have to have an opening and a closing. So it's February 11th, started a few days ago, and it'll run through March 11th. Um, mail in comment cards. We do have comment cards here. We'll also take the chart notes. Yeah, well, I mean, we'll, we'll write your notes down if you don't want to, but that's, they're not really cards, they're sheets, right? Those papers right that's there. True. Okay. Yeah. So you can take one of these sheets, write your comment down on it, and give it back to us tonight. You can take it home with you, formulate your thoughts. You can drop it off here at the ranger station. You can drop it off down at the supervisor's office. You can mail it back to me. Um, and then we'll use that input um, to, to guide the final actions that are listed in the, uh, in the rec site analysis and facility strategy document. The next slide just says, questions but I'm going to go back to this one to leave that that www address up there in case anybody wants to write it down and make comments online so that's that's all the, the formalized presentation that we have tonight um, just a couple of things I'm going to put that map up on the screen and I'm probably going to get up and back that map up a little bit so that's a map uh, Holly why don't you describe what's on that map you better sure, have I could talk about the different things that we have. Yeah. So this is a draft of the, the five-year strategy. So in here are all the recommendations that we would like to do at the different sites throughout the forest, not just Rochester Middlebury, but also Manchester. Um, what we have done to try to make it easier for people who have interest in particular areas is all the recommendations in here are what you see on the map as little comment bubbles. Both this and the maps are online. And the comment bubbles just say at each site what the proposed actions would be in the next five years. I also have some frequently asked questions, not enough for everybody. We are excited that we have a big crowd. I'm sorry we didn't plan better for it. But we can make some copies of these. And a lot of it is just a summary of what Chris has already talked about. We also have had some questions from people. And I just want to be clear, Chris said it as well that th this does not look at trails. This is developed recreation. So it's things like campgrounds. It does include uh, trail heads, shelters, day use areas. But this analysis does not go into any sort of trail management. Ollie, when you said website, this is up on the website. I, got, I saw the link where you could make comments, but I didn't see a map or anything. Mm -hmm. Do you want them to navigate and I can show everybody where it is? Okay. You, you're plugged in? You don't get it on the public website. I do. There were some PDF files going that were um, linked underneath. If you pulled up this particular project, you had to scroll down. And it was there actually, you know what? I got the MailChimp newsletter from the Addison County Bike Club. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay, so that was the link that I followed that actually took me to the email that probably yeah. put somebody over here. So, um, oh, if it just went to an email, then yes, yeah. no. If you go to our right. homepage, and right. we can just show you where it's at so people yeah, can just find it. Bear with me for a minute. 
I will say too, when just to kind of summarize a bit of what our recommendations are before people hello, Hi, are up there. Dave. Um, the majority of our sites have recommendations for either no action or for improving kiosks and signage. That's something that we know we want to do at a lot of different places. Uh, so that is the majority of our recommendations at this point. Where is it? Oh, is it got a big? No, it doesn't. It, it was down at the bottom. Keep going down. Yeah. Forest Service seeking comments or something. Like that. Under spotlight. Oh yeah, there you go. Yeah. I was too impatient. So they're right here. Okay. Yeah. There's the link to make the comments. And then back to the north half map. So, questions, comments, thoughts? And help yourself to a granola bar <laughs> also, if you'd like one. Yeah, I, I had a question of Polly or Chris. Um, you say that the forest can maintain 45 of the 138 sites to regionally require standards. Uh, so that's operation. But then, uh, let's see. Are you looking at the draft? Yeah. You want to tell me what page you're on? Oh, let's see. I was in the summer of the page. Okay. I, uh, but then, um, I don't see it now, but then it said you, you could operate them, but you couldn't maintain the same number or the, to the regional standards. So you're saying, at some point, if you can't maintain them, then you won't be able to operate them to that standard. Is that correct? It is saying that as budgets go down, we'll have to make hard decisions about where we potentially have to either reduce infrastructure or close infrastructure because we wouldn't be able to maintain to the minimum standard, if I'm understanding your question. Yeah, so at some point, the 45 sites that are now operated to standard would drop. Or you might reduce infrastructure. Maybe you take out a toilet. There's different ways of accounting for the funding that you may not have. I'd phrase that as could, not would, drop, right? I mean, because it's an unknown, mm -hmm. right? So they, if appropriations change or business models in the Forest Service change, we could find ourselves in that situation. I'm a, I'm a tend to be a glass half full <laughs> kind of guy, so I would like to think that you know we and. And working with Holly for so many years, she's sort of the same way that you know we would look at alternative before moving to like we have to close. We would look for alternative ways to maintain the existing operation. You know, could, could we find a partner? Could we find a volunteer? Could we look at a different business model? So, okay, but regardless, both operations and maintenance has to be done to the regional standard for that site, correct? Yes, to the extent that po is possible and that we can fund, yes. Okay. I don't know, but this just seems kind of strange, you know. If we haven't got money to take care of what we got now, mm -hmm. why are we even planning more that we won't have money for to take care of down the road, you know? There's been instances where a lot of this stuff has ended up on local taxpayers because it's supposedly such an economic boom to the area that they have to keep it. Uh, I can't think of something that would be Forest Service that would end up on Well, local I'm not necessarily. I mean, it comes out know, of federal Specifically taxes, Forest Service, but similar setups. Mm -hmm. I just kind of wondered about that, you know. I mean, First thing we're talking about is not enough money to take care of what we got. And this meeting is like, you know, planning more stuff down the road. Think of the, do you have that sheet, Holly, that has the, like, what's... Summary of action? Yeah. Let me, I was making copies of it. I think it's there. I'll go grab the copies. 
Um, Holland's going to get something. I think what you see here, Harlan, if you look at what we're doing on the green overall and in Rochester Middlebury in particular is um, you will see some new things. Mostly that's a tweak to an existing infrastructure and I can just, I'll just use the, um, because you live down there, down on Bingo, some of those decisions coming out of Robinson, you know, like moving the kiosk from where it was yeah, to site yeah. one and then creating another campsite to make up for the campsite that was lost. So you're, you're ending up at the status quo to some degree, but you have a new action to get there. Yeah. Okay. So that's well, what you're I'm seeing. I'm not new talking action. about, you know, things like that. I'm talking about, you know, new trails, you know, uh, new infrastructure. Yeah, we don't have any new infrastructure projects planned on the north half yeah. at this point in time. Um, and that's again back to my comment about, you know, conditions change, needs change, and we have to be able to be flexible enough to adapt to those. But at this point in time, you know, we're not planning on building another campground somewhere um, or, you know, putting in a new shelter on the a new shelter on the long trail. We're looking to replace the shelter on the long trail, but not adding another shelter at the long trail and having the Forest Service have to take on the burden of managing and maintaining that. We do have partner organizations that have needs and desires, and we work with them if we feel that that, that organization is sustainable and can support an activity. Um, you know, one exa example would be the hut that's at the Chittenden Brook Campground. That is not a Forest Service facility. That's <coughs> owned and operated by Vermont Huts Association as a great public benefit, you know, and people get to experience the National Forest by going there, but we have no responsibility for the maintenance or care or upkeep of that facility. So, that's kind of a, that, that's a win-win. Providing the property that is on. Correct. Right. Which you was an existing campsite, which we didn't have to do anything to. Right. To do, you, to do you get so. a cut of any of the fees that are charged? They pay a special use permit fee um, that goes back into the Treasury. That type of permit, the way it's structured, it goes back into the U.S. Treasury. It doesn't come directly to the forest. Some other permits could come directly to the forest, but just due to the, the structure of that type of permit, it doesn't come directly to us. So this is what Holly just brought back in, this sheet right here. Um, if you, I don't know if there's not enough for everybody, but if everybody wants one, we can make enough for everybody. More copies are coming out. Just kind of look across the top. This is what's contained in the rec site analysis for the Rochester Middlebury District. So it's, you know, improving accessibility, shelter, lean to modifications, no change to site, blah, blah, blah. You can read it all across the top. It's broken out into categories. Um, so if you're interested in one aspect or another, you can dive right into that or focus on that. Mark? Chris, yeah, this is good because this when I was trying to read what was in the document, it wasn't real clear all the time about what was happening. You mean the right site so analysis wasn't perfectly clear? <laughs> <laughs> but so there's a column here right in the middle, C partner volunteer meeting support for two trailheads, the Patel and then the Cooley Glen, Emily Proctor. What type of so for trailheads, just to give an example, what type of support or partnership would you be looking for there? Because it's not like there's a uh, campgrounds or you know a toilet or anything like that. I mean, there might be a toilet there. I don't remember for sure. But anyway, what are, what are you looking for as an example at trailhead support? Sometimes it's even just the presence of people who are there and helping to pick up trash and helping to be around that area because maybe people are coming and expanding camping where they shouldn't be camping and just helping to make sure that. If that's happening, they're dragging in brush and stopping people from doing things that they shouldn't. <laughs> okay, so just like periodically visiting or something like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then, the, if I remember correctly, the Forest Road bill going back to Cooley Glen and Emily Proctor, it's in pretty bad shape. Are you guys going to do anything about that? It's a town road. Oh yes. It's town of Lincoln Road all the way right up to the parking lot. <laughs> um, we we have been talking with the town of Lincoln. They they have some moderate interest in, in giving up that road. Um, they're, they're contemplating it. Um, so if, if they were to do that, we would pick it up and we would do some, some maintenance to it. We, we may also, we have the ability, not this year, but we also have the ability to put some funding in what's called a, a roads agreement with the town where we can redirect some federal funds to um, make some, do some care of road 
town roads and access federal land or county roads or state roads, um, which we could do, but we've been kind of holding off on that, hoping that the town will make up its mind what they want to do with that road first. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, and it is in quite bad shape. <laughs> yes. Chris, um, yep. under the proposed fees, you've only identified three areas of potentially adding a $5 a day or a $20 annual pass. I guess I'm interested in how is it that you came to the conclusion of only identifying those three sites versus some other potential um, kind of hot spots on, on the district that might also afford some um, you know, income, so to speak, to come back to that site to help yep. maintain it. So we were trying to balance not wanting to have all of our sites be fee sites. It's something that our neighbors to the east and the white skin, they put in a lot of fees and they pulled back on some fees. And so we were looking at places where we have made significant investments or are proposing to make significant investments. Leopards with the fishing pier, parking lot design, Warren Falls with some investments that we have done there recently, like the observation area in the new parking lot. <coughs> and Robert Frost, it, improvements that we made last year and are looking to make forward. That answer your question. And also trying to spread them throughout the forest. We didn't want to have, you know, have Warren Falls and Blueberry Lake both have a fee when they're in the same town. Right. So, so what happens if you don't get the, the fishing pier or the parking lot at these leopards? You've got to identify as two things that have been in the works and obviously you know, the funding issue is right. a big hurdle for a lot of things. So um, without those coming to fruition, does that then mean that you wouldn't implement the no. Yeah, those two things wouldn't be required elements for us to charge a fee there. <laughs> and others, I don't, Holly may have said that because I was transitioning over to my computer. This one last thing. And other things, we sites that we didn't include were sites where, like Texas Falls is a good example. Did you say this already? Where the stay time is so short for most people who visit there, you know, they park at the observation site, they get out, they walk across, they walk across the bridge, they look at the waterfall, and then they leave. Um, we felt that a site like that maybe wasn't the best place to <coughs> put a fee in what place. What about Silver Lake? The people so that hike in there. Silver Lake there. has a campground right. fee on it already. Um, you get a lot of day use there. Do get a lot of day use there. We, we talked about Silver Lake. Um, we talked about a lot of sites, um, and we, I, I don't remember the ration, specific rationale at this point for Silver Lake, but that is one that we decided not to charge a fee for. And if I, one of the reasons it comes to mind is that, you know, if someone leaves their car, they walk all the way up there, they see a fee tube, they don't have any money with them anyways, are they really going to turn around and go back down? Uh, compliance what might be- What put in the parking lot? Then you'd be charging a fee for parking, parking at Falls of Lana and not day use at Silver Lake. They and not have and Falls of Lana doesn't meet any of the criteria to charge a fee at. So Silver Lake would be a good one in my opinion um, from a you know income perspective if everybody who went there paid, um, but it's, it would be a little challenging from a compliance perspective in my opinion. In context of the overall analysis, uh, there has been discussion in the press and elsewhere recently uh, about the Adirondacks, a uh, number of people there, number of people trying to park, a uh, number of people on the trail. Uh, some of the state parks in Vermont, they're talking about that. Is that a problem in a place within the domain you folks are responsible for? Parking concerns? Just getting towards too many people, reaching capacity, getting to the point. I'm curious about this because I'm seeing it in various areas. It's a point of interest. I would think it might possibly affect you. I am just curious as to whether it does. Mm -hmm. I would say there are definitely sites that on given days are exceeding their capacity. Warren Falls is a great example. On a hot July day, it exceeds capacity. You see the spillover into out of the parking lot onto the road. Um, a great day at Brandon Gap might exceed capacity. But I think that 
on a sustained basis, we don't see a lot of our sites overflowing capacity. I mean, there's definitely those days. And there are some sites that overflow the parking capacity. I mean, parking capacity is one thing. That's an infrastructure issue. Like site capacity, carrying capacity of the site, that's a different issue. So like Lefferts is one, is a good example. We're, we, we are not in exceeding the site capacity there, but on a warm summer day, we're probably exceeding the, I know we're exceeding the parking capacity. So we would look to address the parking capacity there to try to get it more, more appropriate for what we feel would be the site capacity. And the other place that that comes to mind is Falls of Lana, is that parking area on Route 53. On a nice sunny day in the summer, that is overspilling. Um, people going down and parking at Branbury and then hiking up. Um, that's another place that we're a little pinched on parking there, but we're, we're talking about maybe getting 10 extra spaces in there somehow to try to get some more parking. And there is, if you didn't see that, there is a category where we're trying to expand parking at some of those sites. Mm -hmm. Falls of Lawn is captured as it's called Silver Lake South. <coughs> so what I'm not hearing, for instance, is, is actual hitting the limitation of number of people on trails or whatever, but access in general sometimes tends to overflow. Okay. There are sites we eyeball. Deer Leap is one where we, we sometimes, I maybe it's just me, um, I sometimes worry about capacity at Deer Leap of people, number of people going up there, number of people on the trail, number of people, not so much on the trail, but people at the top. Warren Falls is certainly a site that we have we keep an eye on from a carrying capacity perspective. I mean, I don't know how many of you have frequented Warren Falls, but on a warm summer day, um, you can barely find a place to sit down and you better watch above because someone will you know, be jumping off the rocks above you into the water. Um, so parking there is a good thing. We, we put the parking in, we designed it for what we thought would be an appropriate capacity, but spillover and parking on the street, which is beyond our control, is, is what's causing it to be mm -hmm. over on certain days. Well, you know, when you promote all this stuff, in order to bring the people in, you can only expect that they're going to come, you know, especially mm -hmm. with what we got. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, for instance, going out through the Gulf, you know, the falls. <coughs> I mean, it, it was a problem before, but now we got a big wooden, it just sucks people right in there now. So you get a hot day during the summer. You've got traffic up and down the road, and that's not a good place to have people parking on the side of the road. Oh, Granville Gulf, is that what you're talking Correct. about? Correct. Yeah. I see the same thing happening up on Brandon Gap. I mean, on a good day, that parking lot's full and people are parked up and down the road. You know, we're creating these future problems. And, you know, we got to start putting the brakes on here someplace, you know? Mm -hmm. Come on, somebody. <laughs> <laughs> I see this happening, but I don't know whether this is even under your preview. Okay. I, I live in Pittsfield, and I travel River Road in Killington, where they put the trailhead walk through there. We have Thundering Falls. Thundering yes. Falls? Yes. yes. Yeah, that's, that's us. That is OK. okay. <laughs> I go down that road almost every day. And the things that I've seen, I can't believe buses. Full bus loads. There's only four parking spaces there, which is fine. I have seen fist fights there. I've seen people throwing bottles. Uh, I've seen people fall off that little bridge. Um, it's really strange. And I've seen people who work in the area, somebody I know, stop the car and said, because nobody would move. The whole road was blocked for a long time. And I saw her, I knew who she was, and she said, she got out of the car and she screamed at these people and said, you know, some of us have to go to work. And it was, it was getting very uncomfortable. I felt like, you know, it was like violence was coming. Um, so that's something I see. Yeah, I haven't heard that about I that location. That's that the either. first I've heard about that. Oh. Um, th there. I've definitely seen when vehicles can get backed up, and I have seen larger vehicles who have tried to park there. Uh, I haven't heard of the violence or seen the violence. I mean, I never saw anybody hit somebody, but it was like... They were so agitated yeah, about it. Yeah, they were so agitated about it. It was, you know, and it was between somebody who was local and people who... And I looked around and I didn't see one 
there was not a car there from Vermont. But uh, I think that day I was like over 20 cars that I saw there and parked on both sides of the road. Mm -hmm. And this person was being held up and could not get to work. And she was really, really mad. So that's I have noticed. Okay. Yeah, that's yeah. a site that we don't have any right now any plans to change. Parking there would be a little bit of a challenge, even the parking that's there. Was recently expanded. It's kind of squeezed in and re yeah, recently expanded because it's such a narrow spot right there, right where the Appalachian Trail crosses that mm -hmm. road. But it's also a day use destination, short hike. It is, and it is, I mean, you're right. It's advertised, it's the only universally accessible portion of the Appalachian Trail in Vermont. Right. So it's, it's something that I think a lot of businesses and the town itself are pointing people to go visit. Oh, yeah. The town itself, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah. Uh, the local newspaper is pointing people there. Right. Um, you know, it's like the same. I used to walk on the dam, Kempon, mm -hmm. and I would never go over there. Anymore. The drug use is strong. Uh, there's no quiet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's boom boxes everywhere, yeah. uh, and it's getting very dirty. Dog, uh, dogs, mostly dogs. Yeah. You know. And I've had people have, you know, I've had dogs come at me from the people who are parking. parking there. So <laughs> it's not a place I go anymore. Really Do you have thoughts on something you would like to see done there differently? If I still ran, ran the newspaper, I would have <laughs> stopped advertising it. Uh, I think that's the problem, you know, <laughs> I mean, start putting a big neon sign up saying, hey, check this out. They do. Yeah. You know, and it's you're getting branded. you're getting the whole cross cut. <coughs> I know. would hold that the stop advertising might be quite helpful. Uh, although much of that is not in the power of these folks. It's more right. the model the state has picked up. Mm -hmm. Heads and beds tourists. Mm -hmm. for adding a, a lean-to at Chittenden Brook Campground. Yeah, so that's something that was actually <coughs> already approved through the Robinson decision. And when we did that, it was the fact that we have had a really hard time attracting hosts there. Hosts who do come tend to be people who are camping for the entire six-month period. And so they tend to <coughs> leave early. Um, so we were trying to find some sort of amenity that we could provide that might make it more comfortable for the host store things in that aren't getting wet. And Ready? And then the other one, is, um, the Sunrise Shelter Campground. Is there an actual campground at Sunrise Shelter? Terminology confuses us. Yeah, so all of our shelters are technically considered campgrounds in our database of record. So that's the name that's in there. But it's the Sunrise Shelter. Nope. I think I asked the same question when I saw it on the map. Like, yeah. Is there a campground? Surprise. I've never seen that. Yeah, it's just the name of it. Do they have a laundry? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, is there any news on the, uh, the bike trail coming into uh, Bingo Road? Um, that portion of the bike trail is not, not currently funded. funded currently. Okay. Um, uh, another question. The proposed logging out there, is any of that logging being done to facilitate any kind of trails? I mean, are there any no. connections? So, uh, no, uh, I'll say that. I'll say no. The logging is not being planned to facilitate trails. Um, Subsequent to the logging, when funding is, when funding comes along for that trail, it's not to say that the trail might not follow a, an old skid trail or something like that. I just don't want to say, you know, give you the yeah, impression of something now, Harlan, that yeah, turns into. Yeah, we're talking this, about, yeah. The, but nothing is being like planned, like, oh, we need to cut this tree and clear this area so we, we can put a trail in here later. There's, there's no plans to, like, hook from Bingo Road, go up West Hill. I know they're going to be logging up in there. I'm just 
kind of curious. I got thinking about. Well, the Velomont that was a, the Velomont sections that were approved as part of the Robinson project do connect Bingo to West Hill and over to Chittenden Brook. Coming in from here, but working its way across. So yes, I mean there is a connection so there, and that was approved. Out. That was approved in the Robinson. It's going to come out down by the cemetery. Going to come, yeah, down by Flanders Hill okay, Road. Okay, and then yep. where does it go from there? Going to go. Uh, I was looking to see there is no map currently up on the wall of it. The one map that's not up on the wall is that map. Um, I believe it's going to go. I don't have, it's, my office isn't here to have maps anymore. I, Do you I, have, you could probably pull it up. But no, I, 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 I can go find the map, Harlan. Let me find that. Why don't you guys move on if there's another question or something. Let me go find that map so I can address that answer. Yeah, and I will say as far as develop recreation at Bingo, the decisions that were approved in Robinson were to add two new campsites where there were old sites and that's because um, we had site three that was closed a few years ago and right, then taking right, over site yeah, one. So we're not looking to expand the number of sites, right, just replace right. two that have been closed and then improving some parking that's been done, I believe. Mm -hmm. that's but, it, well, right? that has been done for the new, where site one became kind of the entrance to the campground, where the kiosks are going to be put in this right. year. It, improving the parking at site six and site two has not been done. One of the camp areas. Okay. Yeah. So that's all that's So that's happening. just entails like a pull off or something like that. Or Say that again? That just entails like a pull off or something like that. Just making it larger for like if horses were gonna have like a vehicle in there or an RV wanted to park in there, so there was at least a site where you could have an RV. Not with hookups or anything, but large enough for parking. And they're doing a loop, is that correct? At site one? Or, no, I can't go on. A loop? Um, loop? Nope, it's just a rectangle square for a parking lot. No, that's good. good. Yep. Okay, that's so back Very good. Yes. <laughs> You got me all distracted. I found the map, and then I was looking at the map, and I was walking down the hallway, and I walked right past the doorway here and right into a dark hallway, and I just kept going, and it wasn't until I couldn't see the map anymore that I realized that I just kept walking. So here's what you're talking about. This is this yellow right here is that trail yeah. coming into that parking area, so this is where it would go coming out. Right across. Kind of slabbing across the hill, connecting to the end of, um, what is that? 113, 114 up on uh, west, off West Hill. Yeah. Where was that? The, uh, I don't think the uh, name is off leading at the moment. Derek Kinsler. Yeah, but it's near what's the more known name of it. I don't know up there. Derek Kinsler, but there's another one. It's uh, like three letters or something. Anyways. Three letters. Yeah, maybe I'll make, that. Up, right? I'm making that up. The ABC room? Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> yeah. Can I see that? Are there questions or feedback about the site? If you haven't seen one of these, if you have one in front of you that you're not looking at and want to pass it around, you can do that too. Jones Mountain Road. Yeah, Jones Mountain. It's coming up in that area. Not on that road, but in that general area. Yeah, so it, we talked a bit earlier that it is a five year strategy, so it's not right now a decision that's implementing any of these actions. A lot of it is not contractor, like excavator type work. Um, but yes, when we do it, it's the same process that we, we have used for all of our projects, the things that we go out to bid, they put into agreements with partners, um, anything that we have a final decision to move forward, we would do it that way. Okay, and so a percentage of this would be contracted out, or is it's kind of marginal about the type of work that you've done? So if you look at one of these, I think it will help because you can see that things like improving a kiosk in appearance, right. obviously That's we're not going to be contracting that out. Right. Things like making um, shelter changes or modifications, if we were building new shelters or if we're putting in toilets also at shelters, a lot of those are done with Green Mountain Club, so through their agreements. Okay. Um, Parkers. Parking lot designs would be things that would be contracted out. Okay, so a mixture of everything. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah. 
how do you prioritize that there's a lot on this list? How do you prioritize what is going to be done? Yeah, so that's kind of the wizardry of what this document does is we have somebody who works out of the Washington office, he's a data analyst, and when he takes all the different figures that we have provided, whether it's um, use and occupancy of a site, the cost of things, and it helps us prioritize what sites we should focus on first. So that's, this is actually done, um, it comes up with a score, and I honestly don't know the wizardry of how he comes up with that score, but a lot of the data that feeds into it. And this is prioritized. And you so how do you calculate use for like uh, falls upon a solar lake? Mm -hmm. You know, there's no really, I mean, like, other than the campgrounds, you know occupancy there, but how many days, how do you calculate that? So a mixture of looking at our national visitor use monitoring and seeing how people are using different sites, observations of our field going personnel, mm -hmm. and it's um, something that has been recorded. We didn't just come up with the numbers for this process it has been recorded into our database of record. Mm -hmm. So over time, and then it's adjusted, and sometimes we look at to see compared to different sites, or if we've added amenities and people are using it more, then we'll adjust it. And so these <coughs> use figures are based on the last survey that was done a few years ago? That's part of the data that helps us determine, yeah. And, and we had ours 2000. Coming up this year. Yeah. It's happening as we speak. So we have had them 2005, 10, 15, and 20. We have started in October. Now, given that prioritization, Sue, there are other things that come into play. I mean, the system turns out the prioritization based on the stats, right? They run in the background without the human factor. The human factor comes into play where, you know, do we have a partner organization that, you know, really wants this to move forward and can help us facilitate something in there earlier than it would normally be prioritized? Is there a funding opportunity at either externally or internally that we can get a hold of and that would help us put something forward ahead of the number one priority, even if it's the number 25 priority? Mm -hmm. So, you know, th those, those opportunities, being opportunistic about it. in the summertime and um, it might attract people that are over at Riker or you know staying somewhere that uh that renters or something you know but that's just that's that's really all I 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sure. So I, mean, I can address a couple of things yeah. in there, and you can jump in if I miss any of the points. So I think one, we are looking at how it is known as the Bellamont. Uh, we work with Angus a lot on trying to look for opportunities to expand, including up into Hancock. So that's being explored. We do have a partner. A lot of our trails are adopted by partners, almost all of them, and so we really rely heavily on partners for helping us with that maintenance. But trails are either in the Forest Service uh, summer trails or winter trails. So the trail that you're talking about is actually a summer use trail, so it's not maintained in the winter. Um, but you're welcome to report blowdowns to us. We, if we have staff, we do have field going staff too, who if they have time to get to a blowdown, they will get to it, not necessarily on a summer trail in the winter. Um, and we'll look to partners to help us. We have people who are chainsaw certified. Um, so I would encourage you to volunteer with uh, a local partner organization. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> I, move the, I move the stumps when I can and, you know, toss a tree here or there. But yeah. And you're always free to, you know, if you notice something, if you're out and about on a bike or on a foot or whatever, and you notice something, you're always welcome to just pop it on the ranger station or even just stick a note on the door you know, if, if we're closed, um, you know, that, hey, there's a big blowdown on this trail, and we'll, we'll either get it ourselves or we'll reach out to one of our partners to try to take care of it. The other thing that you missed is there, there once was a trail that went from here north into Hancock, um, a, a winter trail, um, and um, because it crosses all private land, mostly private land, we had one landowner who didn't want the trail on the property any longer, and that broke the whole connection. Um, and it's been dead for how, how long? Uh, Three, four years. Yeah, anyway. More than that. I don't think it ever was. I've been here since 2012, and it's never been open since then. So, yeah. Boyd has been dead. Yeah, Boyd, yeah Boyd, there also used to be a trail up high that connected into Hancock up across from Texas Falls, but that washed out in numerous floods and is, is not coming back. What was the guy's problem then? Uh, just didn't want the snowmobiles. I, you guys probably know more about the, the history there, but didn't. I'm not sure what trail you're talking about. Barry Bowling. Oh, that one. Barry. Okay. The salt from the snowmills are killing them. Yeah, it's something about damaging Maple vegetation. Trees. I will know. Uh, so I'm certified chainsaw operator <coughs> and I do maintenance on Oak Ridge and uh, up to around Silver Lake. Uh, and the, the point about knowing where the stuff is, I've, I've got to almost use mental telepathy to know whether there's stuff that needs to be worked on. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, a couple, me and some of the other guys from Middlebury sometimes go up there, but uh, there, it really would be nice if we could have some sort of reporting <laughs> that worked for everybody with minimal effort. So we are actually looking into that. We have a, and I don't want to go too down the rabbit hole of yep. trails tonight. Because, to talk about because trails, yeah. I will, and I, and I know when I saw a lot of people come in, I was like, oh, everybody's going to want to talk about trails, just because I know you all. But I will say that um, one of the things that we have been looking at is a, an opportunity that the state has. They use apps where anybody who has a smartphone can use an app and kind of report where different things are. Sometimes it's just hard in the federal government with our systems. They don't talk to public apps or websites mm -hmm. well. Um, so I think we are looking at different ways that we can make that more efficient. Because I agree, I mean, we have a board back here that blowdowns get reported to us yeah. all the time. And it's often you know, somewhere in the middle of an eight mile trail that you have to try to find that blowdown. So I can appreciate that for sure. Yeah. And we're also open to suggestions, people who are much smarter at um, apps and GIS type stuff than myself. Yeah, no, folks has it. Trail forks works really well. Yep. You can take a picture, it'll put a pinpoint, show you which end of the trail that it's on. So oh, I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's often just and not it's reported free. to us that way. Yeah. And it's free. Uh, yeah, trail forks. I will say, uh, one of the other things that you mentioned was maybe kind of like register sheets or something. That becomes, honestly, a maintenance nightmare a lot of places. We do have a few register boxes out there. They are staff by volunteers for the most part. They pick up the sheets for us a lot of the times. Um, but we had more boxes at one point and have gone away from that. Yeah. In consideration of this room, uh, there's one group that hasn't really spoken up yet, and that's the wildlife. And it is a concern of mine as I watch 
what we are calling progress in our green mountains. So I think it's just maybe we should be giving them phones with apps so that they can report in too. Uh, I don't know, but it, it, it just seems like we have walked away a bit from the wildlife. Well, the log, it definitely helps the animals to survive. It seems to. We definitely notice a bump in, uh, especially the deer population, grouse populations, Absolutely. songbird Rapids. populations. You know, after we do a harvest in, the, you know, five to ten years after we do a harvest. Or even a couple. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's an immediate reaction yeah, sure. for some species. Songbirds, it takes a little bit longer, a couple more years for them to it to grow up a little bit, but then they like those edge areas a lot, so. And uh, there's one bear, um, you go out on Grand Hill, go up on Bull Mill Hill, you go up Bull Mill Hill, and then you uh, go over the saddle, and uh, end up back at Texas Falls, mm -hmm. and bear out there. Do you chip a lot on your logging operations, or do you just like lay down? It's a mix. Mix? Yeah. No, I couldn't tell you what the exactly that we don't, it depends on what the outcome is. Um, you know, sometimes they'll take the um, the tops that they dra drag back to the landing, and if they have a chip van there, they'll chip them into the van. Um, if we're doing a, a, a clear cut that's being converted into a permanent opening, that would be a chip operation probably. They would try to take everything we're trying to get it to convert it to that permanent opening. We don't do a whole heck of a lot of that because um, we have a lot of openings existing. But if, when we do our analysis, we determine that you know we're able to offer it in the openings on the landscape in that area, we might create a permanent opening. Like this part of Upper White River up on Patterson Brook Road um, and along the Upper White River Road there, 55, 101, you'll see some newly created clear cuts in there that are going to be permanent openings. Is that just the clear cuts that you're going to chip? What's that? Is that just the clear cuts you're going to it chip? Depends on, it, we don't always chip clear cuts. It depends on what the, the yeah, ultimate like outcome is. They're going to be taking out whole trees? Or are they going to be leaving tops in the woods? Or? Like, they'll leave tops in the woods. It depends it, it depends on what the mitigation for that particular unit is. So if it's uh, if the, the soil <coughs> is shallow to bedrock, they'll typically leave the tops in place. Yeah. Um, I mean, some of the tops, most of the time, some portion of the top is coming out attached to the tree. Um, sometimes they drag it back in. Uh, sometimes they chip it on the on the landing. Yeah. Bruce, you say? Yeah. The Chittenberg seal that's ongoing right now, they chipped that whole first unit, which is a conversion to an opening. Not they were following two tractor trailer loads a day out of there. It uh, went to Burlington Electric. I didn't know if it was part of the, the wildlife you're seeing come back or supporting the deer population that's through non-chipping. That doesn't nothing, nothing do that doesn't seem to have any bearing on it. It's just the open ground and that flush of new growth that comes up that pulls deer in. Okay. Okay. An unrelated recreation. <laughs> An unre unrelated <laughs> to recreation. <laughs> Yeah, any other thoughts about things that you are seeing? Back to the recreation analysis. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing recreation now. 
it didn't warm up. Hunting would be recreation. Right? Yeah. It just seems like a lot of hunting territory is getting chopped up for a trail for this, trail for that. Uh, we don't need a trail for everything, you know. I mean, people, if they want to get out in the woods, they can't. All they got to do is walk, you know. And at some point, we're going to run out of places to put trails to. Well, this is about Angus McCutcher um, with Rasta, and um, I've been part of the effort of some of the trails. Um, I just wanted to applaud the Forest Service for, um, when we look at new trail users, um, uh, garage at the same time, they're also looking at, um, you know, overall trail, you know, too many new trails everywhere, um, just the trails. Um, I'm a big fan of trails, but at the same time, I feel that we need to look at, this is my personal perspective, you know, um, big picture, wildlife, and all that stuff. We can't put trails on. Um, and that's something I think the board has done a really good job of guiding, um, you know, users, kind of adapting. Times are always changing. Uh, users are always changing. I think it's uh, very strategic for them to um, try to work with those changes uh, just at the end. I know it's never perfect. You know, there's a lot of people out there. All people want to get out in the woods, have that experience. I think that's important to get people aware. They can. Of that, they how can. to manage that use. How the course of most of you um, is a challenge, and I applaud him for, you know. Yeah, it's a balance, and yeah. we're losing. Yeah. You know, it seems kind of, somebody comes up with a new idea, oh, great, let's do that, you know? And it's, you know, Brandon Gap, you know? I mean, you yeah. get 50 cars in there on a weekend. You got so, all those people out there skiing. Yeah. Now, I don't know, I don't, I don't see any outhouses by the parking area. You know, I mean, I just don't see how having, if you've got 50 cars, you've probably got 100 people, at least. Um, if you go out and there. that amount of people in an area, I don't care if it's just for two hours. What does that do to the wildlife? You know? I mean, I agree. You know, there's... Yeah, and if those people already ski everywhere, out there, everywhere else. And yeah, there's there's some big to do coming up. What the 29th up there? I mean, they got some big national. So we are. I, mean, I do want to say too, cars? we are monitoring for wildlife there. We've been doing a couple of year studies to make sure that we are not causing undue impacts to wildlife before we consider the possibility of having any more backcountry skiing. But I do want to bring the focus back to here and less about a debate um, on things that are not what this meeting is about tonight. I'm just using that for an example. Yep. You know, I'm not trying to, you know. I understand. Well, but I do really want to hear from people if there's work. other concerns about more <coughs> feedback on what we have in front of us well, tonight. That's what I'm that's trying to do. But Harlan, you're, you're talking about trails. Yes. Yeah. And this isn't this 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 no, topic trail? isn't isn't about trails. Future. The future. No, it's not about future trails. This is about recreation sites like campgrounds, well, trailheads. Brandon, that's not a recreation site? That, that one actually is. A, I mean, is a yeah, that's okay. The trailhead is, yes. That's but, the new problem we've created. Yeah. <clears throat> I was curious about the Texas Falls upgrade. It seemed like it was a pretty high figure, if I recall correctly. What's involved in that? What's the, yeah. the details? Sure. So we actually have plans. For, do you have those plans on your computer? Uh, no, I could probably find them. We do have plans that have been designed for a while. Um, so you've seen the, the large bridge. That was the one. That was just one piece of that project that was implemented. So that's accessible. But there's a trail that has been designed that gets from the the parking lot where the, the first parking lot with the toilet to that bridge, and then on the other side having a little bit of an accessible overlook. So it's increasing accessibility to connect to that bridge instead of having to go right down the road. I mean, that was supposed to be a temporary fence. But there are concerns with it being right next to the road, and it exceeds grades for accessibility. He's showing you the designs, actually, if you look up on the screen. <laughs> Engineering design, right? So this is the bridge that's there, I believe, right, Hunter? Mm -hmm. So you can see that there was supposed to be a cross. There was supposed to. It, it sort of mimicked the old design that was there, the, the, mm -hmm. the older design, but it would be improved, so there would be a little overlook just below the bridge. 
There's the trail that I was talking about on this so side. So here's the road. Right now you walk down the road, la di da. Mm -hmm. um, it was supposed to come down to the little promontory that sticks. If you're familiar with the site, this little rock promontory that sticks out and then come back around and connect here. So you wouldn't have this road walk. Yeah, you don't need to see that. <laughs> so how are you just kind of formalizing what a lot of people do anyway? When I go there, I kind of follow that little path down to that promise, you know what I mean, and walk along the water there. So you're just going to, you're going to... But you can't get, right now, you can't get from here to the bridge without walking up onto the road. Oh, that's right, yeah. You, you, <coughs> you, can, you can wander around down here to a point, but then you have to come back out. Yeah. This okay. is the existing path that's there. Chris, was that going to be a trip, uh, composite thing or pressure trees? Um, I would get, we, we're going more and more to composite, but we, it would have to be all specced out, you know, it would be in the bid package. <coughs> I, I would guess it would be whatever's on the Texas Falls Bridge, which is composite. Yeah. And it would be all accessible, too. May I ask if, if it's the similar treatment to what just happened at the Robert Frost Trail? Hmm? Which is terrific. Yeah. Looks yep. wonderful. Good. Thank yeah. you. Love it. Yes, it would be very similar. And that is part of this too, is looking to expand accessibility on the mm -hmm. south side of the south branch of the middle area at Robert Frost. You know, we have several higher dollar projects that are in here. They're not new. They're improvements to existing. Um, so it's new in that way. It looks new. <laughs> But it's not a new new site. So, Texas Falls. What we have our plans for down at Leffers for parking lot expansion, and then Robert Frost. Um, those are the three big dollar ones, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not missing one, am I? Mm -hmm. Right now, we're trying to address Robert Frost. You know, we're we're putting our eggs in the basket of Robert Frost at the moment. Um, it's not to say that annually we don't submit a request to our regional office for funding for Leffert's Bond, funding for Texas Falls, um, on the chance that some pot of money will come available and it'll one of you know one of the analysts down in, at the Washington office, or the regional office, will go, "Wow, this really fits this you know priority that we have and we have money for," and they would like filter us some money for it. Um, at this point, it's happened at Robert Frost. Um, but it hasn't happened at the other two locations. So, but we, we continue to seek funding. And all three of those sites, I would say, the large ticket item is part of our commitment to trying to improve accessible, accessibility at different sites. And I think you look at across the state of Vermont, a lot of limited opportunities for recreation accessibility. So, May I ask um, if part of the application for funding for those two sites that have not been funded yet ever include um, the fact that they are in depressed areas within uh, central Vermont and that it would be beneficial to be able to have something that attracts people to those village centers? The internal process that we submit mm -hmm. to, the capital investment process, mm -hmm. it does not account for local economics. So, you don't, so we don't, no. and we're not able to say how beneficial? External processes, yes. Okay. We're even going to local funding sources. Because I noticed that the, the Hancock uh, businesses are in distress, and something like the Texas Falls would be hugely beneficial to them. Mm -hmm. know if there's uh, more than 30 seconds of silence <laughs> um, I'll call the meeting it to be adjourned um, other thoughts uh, um, I'd like to bring one thing up I hate good. to sound like a bad person but uh, <laughs> you folks you know we're talking about recreation sites mm -hmm. You have a recreation site on Route 100. I told you about it before. The, it's an actual shooting. The Sherburn Trail? Yeah. No. <laughs> that one on Route 100 by uh, Spring Hill. <clears throat> it is an actual shooting range. I went through a shooting range safety course. The first thing they told us was the legal stuff. Most people will swear 
oh no, we don't have a shooting range. You can't go that way. You actually have a shooting range. If it looks like a duck, cracks like a duck, it is a duck. The same with shooting ranges. If you have concentrated shooting, <coughs> you can't say that is not a shooting range. It's an actual shooting range, and it is very dangerous. You're also building up lead in the soil. It is now a hazardous waste site. That's legally determined by the EPA, and they don't allow slack. In order to deal with that, you've got to do some recycling, and you also have to get rid of the danger. That is extremely dangerous um, to the Green Mountain Golf Course. Green Mountain Golf Course plus Route 100 and a lot of houses down there are directly in line <coughs> with the trajectory killing um, zone. And I went in there, I've been taking photographs the last couple of years of those trees back there. One of them has now been sawed down by bullets. This is a live tree. The others are getting more and more bullets all the time, and there's nothing but blue sky behind these trees where the golf course is down the other side. You've got to do something about it. I, I'm a gun rights guy, but I'm telling you, there is just, this is too much danger and it has to be dealt with. You cannot walk away from this. Um, EPA, for one thing, will, will go and shut it right down, and then they're going to make you guys spend a tremendous amount of money cleaning up the lead, because they have no sense of humor, um, especially with lead. And there's a spring right next to it, underneath it, uh, that people get water out of. But the worst part is somebody will eventually die. That's what they taught us. And you have a very dangerous range. There's only one death. They only kill one person, and then they get shut down flat. Uh, it's unfortunate. The state had one like that, and unfortunately, I had to be the guy to bring it out. But they did the proper mitigation to get this, that uh, place safe. And uh, I had to scream and yell for a while to get that done, too. But this one here, there really is no excuse. You can swear it's not a range, it is a range. Legally, it was a shooting match. So, that's all I need to say on that. Okay. Well, nobody else got anything to say. I'll run my mouth one more time. <laughs> I think, uh, you know, maybe we ought to think about, instead of expanding things, taking care of the things that we have to the best of our ability. Well, I would, I would put forth that hiking <laughs> or trails, and I'm not a snowmobiler, but I was out on a snowmobile today on some, some trails on the National Forest and looking at the work that we're doing at Robert Frost and the improvements that we made at Texas Falls and other places, um, that we do a pretty good job of taking care of um, what we have. Um, we don't hear a lot of complaints from trail users about you know, mismanaged, undermanaged trails. I mean, we well, get I mean, some information. We opened up meeting tonight with, you know, the forecast that we're running out of money to take care of stuff. Yeah, I don't think I said that when I introduced the meeting. Well, so we have to be, we have to think about sustainability moving forward. Exactly. Right. Exactly. That's what I'm. Right, but you, you, you just said that maybe we ought to, do, you know, focus on taking care of what we have, and I think I'm just saying that I think we do. A, given the resources that we have, that we do a pretty good job of taking care of what we have. Um, I, I'm not aware of anything, on, on my district anyways, that I would consider I'm like not, an imminent hazard or anything. poorly managed. I'm talking about the future. Okay. I would also Just hope go on by what was said at the beginning of the meeting, yeah. that we're running out of money. I hope when you do look at this that you see this is, the majority of this proposal is taking care of what we have. It's making improvements where shelters are getting old. It's, it's looking at things that are starting to fall into that state of disrepair and just kind of a recognition and prioritization of how do we focus our dollars on what we do have. So that's a lot of what this process was, was looking at what's out there and what needs updated, replaced, repaired. And I don't want you to see this all new. that you're covering its minerals. Giving the yeah. area the You've got a big you area mm -hmm. with whatever you've got on it, and that's a very small list, really. 
it is. A lot of it really is what some people might think of as just kind of needed maintenance. Critical infrastructure. Yes, I don't want you to just see the length of this list and think it's all, all new. A lot of it's done volunteer money. You're right. Time. Partners bring a lot of volunteer labor, cash match. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. We cannot thank our partners enough. This corner of the room seems to be quiet for a while. <laughs> Been spinning that hat now for 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> ready to go. You think I'm going to like dismiss in any minute, and every time I'm about to, you're like, oh, somebody said something. <laughs> Final thoughts? Oh, there you go. There you go. <laughs> Thank you all very much for coming.